guys. Welcome to the show today. My name is Brooks Conkle. I'm the founder of Gulf Coast BizCon. And so we connect and engage side hustlers and micropreneurs. We believe that when these people connect, good things can happen. And so I've got, um, I've got a good friend that's on with me today, Dr. Gia Wiggins. And so she's been in the HR industry for like 21 years. And so if you are the person that has questions and you don't know what to do in HR, we're going to cover some of that stuff today. She's got all kinds of credentials. Uh, there's all kinds of letters. I had no idea what they meant. We've got, uh, I knew some of them and some of them I did not know, but I'm just going, she's got BAs, she's got MBAs, she's got SPHRs, she's got SHRM dash SCPs. I have no idea what that means. We're going to talk about that. But in 2015, she launched Morale Resource LLC, which is a boutique humans resources consulting firm. And so she specializes in, in providing HR functions for small and medium-sized businesses. So we're going to talk about that. She's also adjunct professor um, of some, some stuff, and we'll talk about that too. And so I'm excited to have today Dr. Gia Wiggins. How are you doing? Hello. I'm wonderful. It's storming like crazy out here in Fairhope today. So hopefully we'll keep power, but it's a good day. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about the storm. It just came through. It just came through me. I, I'm in Mobile, Alabama, and Gia Wiggins is across the bay. We're in we're in Lower Alabama, and we have crazy thunderstorms happening right now. So we yeah, needed the hopefully. rain though. So I'm looking forward Wait. to it. My okra and my tomatoes need this rain desperately. Uh, do you have do you have a garden? You have okras and tomatoes. The I have okra, corn and zucchini okay. and squash. I've got a watermelon going. I've got some Brussels sprouts. I, I love am, it a gardener i picked it up during the phd program with my stress level and i decided to start gardening and every year it gets bigger and bigger so yeah huge garden. i love it that's cool I, did, I didn't know that about you that's mm -hmm. cool um well that's great so look I, I want to chat about all kinds of all kinds of stuff with you. i can literally hear rain in your background it's pretty crazy so yeah it's pretty bad yeah that's cool but um so yeah like how did you how did you decide to go from, I know you have a ton of HR experience in, in your background, and then you somehow made this decision, like, I want to start a company and provide boutique services, like HR services. Like, how, how, did, that, how did that shift happen, or how did that happen? Was it like a, just a light bulb moment, or was it something that kind of happened over time, or how did that, how that work? Preparation met opportunity. Um, okay. I had no desire to start a company um, at the time that I started my company. Um, as you mentioned, I'd worked for large companies and their human resources department, and I loved my job. It was absolutely phenomenal. I love working with people. Um, and so that's all I really know how to do. I tell people all the time, HR was my only marketable skill. I decided to go back to get a PhD um, because I wanted to teach human resources managers um, how to work effectively in organizations. Um, I'd hired them for years. I've trained, um, I don't even know how many, probably in the hundreds at this point, of human oh, resources wow. professionals over my career. And I thought if I could get them at the college level and just show them not from the best case scenario perspective, which is where most HR textbooks come from, but from the, oh my God, everything is literally on fire. How do we keep the organization from going under and catching on fire? Uh -huh. That is what I wanted to train HR um, people to do. And so I decided to go back to um, school to get my PhD because I wanted to be a human resources professor. And while I was in the PhD program, I got my first call from someone I'd worked with before. Um, and I focus, my focus is always um, in organizations is taking them from a little bit of chaos to a place where they're operating effectively. And he had a chaotic situation and he said, hey, can you come over here and do for us what you did over at the company we worked at together? And so I was like, oh, yeah, I'll take a couple of weeks and I'll yeah. jump over and I'll do this project. And in one project, I made almost my annual salary. And I was like, oh, well, this is fun. And then I got a second project, which was a referral, and did the exact same thing with that second project. So uh, four weeks of work, one year of my annual salary. And I made a lot of money at that last job. And I knew that that was something I should probably pay attention to. So we formed the company just so I would have something to build to. Thought mm -hmm. it was going to be a fluke and here we are you know 
going on because five years later and I mean we're going strong and doing some really fun and neat stuff so that's my that's awesome story. so that's a clear uh, that was a clear light bulb moment obviously when you took on a project and you saw the amount of income you made and you know what you made in your job and so you know that's like an obvious like okay I should I should keep I should keep this option open here as, maybe, as yeah. something yeah maybe I should keep my options open and then you got a referral and then obviously I guess that le- clearly if you do good work which obviously you do that leads to more work and so I guess here mm-hmm. so what you're saying is here you are like five years later four years later whatever and it's you're just still still ever evolving that that's cool. yeah so wait, it's you, it's about I, focusing I think I, I think the thing that was really special is that I got to focus on the stuff that I really loved so if there's yeah. a if there's a project um, and even back then, um, there was a part of a pro- the project that they wanted me to do that I could have done, but I really hated that part of HR. I just gave that to someone else. I was like, hey, there's a partner I know that could come in that could do specifically this part. And then I focused on the part that I really enjoy. So I make sure to take on projects that I really, I would have done for free, but you know, I don't. So there you go. How cool, <laughs> how cool. <laughs> People, people, um, you know, that's, I, I, I think people definitely desire to do the, the fact that you were willing to turn down that work or maybe you had the ability. Cause I, I think a lot of times in business people get going, like you, you definitely have to potentially, potentially have to take on some work that maybe you don't want, or it's like a little bit varied. It's not like, it's not completely, you know, niche down until you can get to the point where you can kind of narrow in. That's so beautiful that you were able to do that kind of right up front, like do what you enjoy in that in that realm um and be able to not take on the other projects that's that's beautiful and that to me is like part of the american dream right there um i think it's i think it's really cool i think you're right so i didn't have phd so you have a phd correct i do i do have a phd in business yeah i didn't i didn't have that on your on your on your letter list i need to add that to the bio all these letters i mentioned behind your name i I didn't have ph i didn't have phd i need to. i'm gonna add that in my notes okay so we'll so we'll have that for next time i apologize that's on me that's on me (laughs) i'm not that pretentious i promise but hey still i just i thought it was fun to list all these letters out and phd would have been another good one so um you know that's great so are you um are you still are you doing adjunct professing are you still a professor adjunct professor See, so one thing that I think is really cool about that is I love it anytime that there's a professor that has a ton of this real life, real world experience that didn't only come through the education system. I mean, obviously, I respect that, too, because you have to go and you have to learn to be a teacher. It's its own profession. But, you know, you having a lot of this real world in your company experience, in my opinion, just gives you a different perspective. And it's a perspective that like young people need. They need that like outside perspective. And to me, that's really valuable that you're able to give that. What um what 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 classes are you are you teaching so all these classes? Right or, now, or? Um, at the University of South Alabama, I teach human resources management. Um, at the University of Mobile, I teach um, small business entrepreneurship, um, and intro to business. And um, I'll teach a different class coming up, I think, next semester. I just whatever they need me to do, as long as it's around business and human resources. And by the way, there's a name for what you just described. Um, They call us Pracademics. Pracademics. I did not know there was an official name for that. The Pracademic. Yep. It's someone that has an academic with practical experience. So is that a small group in in the teaching world or the the Pracademics? Is that a smaller group? So not anymore. So that's a new shift um, for universities, especially those that are starting PhD programs. Um, Instead of getting um, students that have just, you know, finished their master's degree, they're going after working professionals who have master's degrees to ask them if they would be interested in a career, um, possibly at least partially in academia. And so in my cohort, I graduated six, we started off roughly about 15. All of us were going to be pracademics. They, we'd come from all walks of life. And um, all of us had, most of us had our own companies. And um, a lot of us worked, you know, some of them worked for other companies and executive positions. And we went through that program together. And um, most of us teach at least part time because it's a labor of love. There's something really special about being able to go into the classroom and not just teach because you don't really teach out of the book as a pracademic. Um, you're yeah. able to go in and you 
focus on a chapter, but let's say, for example, in my um, small business entrepreneurship class, when we're doing a chapter on marketing, then I actually bring people who do marketing into the class to teach a module. And when we're just talking about business plans, then I, the first week they get a copy of the business plan. And as we go through the chapters, they fill out a different part of the business plan and they actually do a mock company. And so there have been companies that have launched from my classes because we did those business plans directly in that classroom. Really? And so it's really like cool that. to have that perspective. That's amazing. That's really cool. Any of those or any of those that you could talk about publicly or not necessarily like not without permission, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There yeah, are, totally there are cool. some that um, we have one that is um, a ballet. There's a, a ballet supply company that special things for dancers, a couple of online clothing stores, um, a, a, a paleo and um, 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 carb free bakery. I mean, just the, the most interesting things, app development, things of that nature, but they just want to know how to take something that they really love and turn it into a business. We're able to do that during the course of a semester. I love it. I think, I think that's awesome. And so I'm actually on the view now that like the majority of those projects that those young people started, like they may, they may not work out long-term, but like hmm. it, that, and here, here's why I say that. The reason why I say that is because if it's the first project they've ever done or first business they've ever launched, they, they may not, they may not have enough experience to, right. to see. But the reason why that excites me is like, Hey, if they all work awesome, but you know, statistics obviously show us that the majority of uh, businesses, you know, don't work, but what it doesn't account for is that like it, that it may be one individual that started five companies and that fifth one is what turned into a huge company. Um, and so that, oh, wait, hold on. I think I may have lost you for a second. Welcome back. <laughs> did, did that storm, did that storm get you? It got me, got me good. It okay, happened like, so fast. I'm like, great. The reason I, I, I know at first you were like, what, like, what, what do you mean they're going to fail? But I, I guess I had a little more, more thinking into that. I, you know, obviously not saying I think they're going to fail. Um, but what I was saying was because it's, it's probably their first business project or whatever, you know, it, statistics, majority of businesses don't work out like whatever, 50% in the first five years and then another, right. it, it's, it's a crazy large amount. But right. it, it, what I was saying was that it doesn't take into account that a business person's successful business possibly is their like third, fourth or fifth like business Amen. that actually really <laughs> works. And so that that's what excites me about these young people is that like the experience that they will get from launching their own project is amazing. Like they'll learn maybe online marketing, they'll learn how to launch, maybe it's a Shopify store using some tools or whatever and figure out how to um, merchandise product or work with, it, um, you know, brokers and inventory and, and manufacturers. I don't know, it, like all those examples you just gave me provide so many things that they can learn from those, those specific experiences. And so, yeah. I've been um, guilty of it too. I mean, I've had iterations of my current business that were failures. You know, they, I will, yeah. and I tell the students that, and we talk about that, and I pick on those failures and say, look, the reason that it's set up this way is because I did it that way and it did not work. Either I wasn't happy or um, it didn't seem genuine or it was stressful. If I'm working on a project and I mean, I am just making my way through it and it is like a grudge fest, it shouldn't be in my offerings because I want to do the things that I really love. And so the, the, the thing that I like to talk to students about and even businesses and business owners, and I mentor a couple of businesses as well, I share with them about you know, networking, the importance of networking and getting to know other people, because there's something that you hate to do that somebody else absolutely loves to do. And mm. you can partner with them and you can even sub them. So when I, the thing that I don't enjoy, I'll go ahead and admit it. I don't like benefits administration. I can't stand it. Um, can I do it? Yeah. Am I good at it? Really good at it. Do I enjoy it? Not at all. And so I made it my business to go out and to find very reputable people who enjoy doing it, who have an entire business model around it, 
And I'll tell you what, you do benefits administration. If you do a really good job, I'll bring you into my client. I'll be there to help oversee the process and I'll allow you to go in and do that business and then I'll manage it. And if we do a really good job, I've got 10 more lined up that I can get you set up mm. for. And by the same token, if you're the benefits person and you're going into all of these organizations and they need HR compliance help in particular, then tell them about me, bring me into those accounts as well. Mm. And so it's that networking. Everybody can eat. And so it's important that as an entrepreneur, that you don't feel like you have to be everything to everybody. If you're married, you can't be everything to, you know, your spouse. You can't be everything to your children. I don't know why we're expected to be in business. Good point. Such a good point. How, um, how do you operate? J just if someone's listening, they're like, oh, I can utilize this. And maybe they're in a different field or something. Like, how do you um, operate those relationships? Are you like white labeling their service or are they... Like, does your client know that you're bringing on this partner and that they they operate that? Like, like how does that um, actually actually operate? In a, so in a I think that it operates differently for different businesses, but I'll talk about the way that okay. I do it. I am very transparent. And mm -hmm. um, in my business model, I only work directly with CEOs and owners of companies. So as a director of so-and-so, you can't bring me in. It has to be the most senior person at the organization that has the ability to influence change. The book has to gotcha. stop with them. And so I'm having a relationship with them. I'm not their employee. I'm their partner. And so we have a lot of dirty secrets that we put on the table and we open the kimono and we share things and I'm in full relationship with them. And so if there is a need and through my process and building policies and procedures for them and training their team, and I see that there is a gap, I tell them, you have a gap. This is exactly what it is. I know somebody, I'm going to bring them in and let them do a consultation for you. This is what it's going to cost you. Would you like them to bill you directly or would you like it to be billed through me? I will help to manage that process. And that way, because there has also been times that I brought someone in to one of my clients and I didn't like how they worked and I kicked them out and I brought somebody mm. else in. You can only mm. do, because I have to, I have to protect that client at all costs. I'm their agent. And so as a result of that, I have to be completely upfront and honest with them to let them know if this is not giving you what we need you to have, then we'll bring somebody else in. Um, but we're doing this together. We're in this together. We're we're gonna sink or swim as a team. Does does that only work if they bill if they bill through you? Is that easier for you to turn around and replace them if they bill directly to the your to the partner? Is it is it up to the CEO to say hey they're not doing a good job and them fire them or? Does, it really does my question make sense? There have been yeah, it makes sense. It, it's it's happened on both ends. It's how, it, and it really kind of in HR it's a little bit different how the billing happens. Um, so it's different than some other where they're completely integrated and whether it happens or not, the person still has to be paid. Um, but in the services that I offer, for example, um, well, that I outsource, I outsource payroll, um, I outsource benefits administration and things like 401k, for example, gotcha. those are three things and recruiting. And those four areas, if they're not doing what they need to do in the implementation, they don't get paid. They get paid in the implementation of um, the project. And so if it's not working out, and I'm not petty, and so, I mean, it really has to be something we can't work our way through. If yeah. it's not working out, they're not providing the best service, then I will end it, or the client can end it, but they don't generally get charged unless um, they're actually implementing the program into the client's um, services. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So um, let, let me switch gears. So, my, a micropreneur. So let's say a company that has less than 10 employees, 10 employees or less. Cause that's kind of like, that's kind of my wheelhouse. That's who we're kind of, that's who we're providing information for. What are things that we need to be on the lookout for? What do we need to know? Are there, I, I kind of want to take the direction, uh, the conversation in that direction. Like are there things that, you know, we can do strategically as you know, these small companies that you just fire, like, is there anything that comes straight to your mind? That we need to be on the lookout for and if not i'll start asking you a question yeah you're oh, like no, yes, I got yes, <laughs> <laughs> i've got, I got a list man 
So um, the thing is, uh, first of all, micropreneurs, um, especially in a creative consultant space, there are tons of them out there. And I think that the biggest thing that they don't understand is that although you are small, you are still responsible for laws. And even if you're not aware of what the laws are, your employees are, you have Mm. to be more knowledgeable than your employees because I promise you, they know exactly what you're supposed to do and what they're supposed to have. And it's usually, I, first of all, I would love to tell you that 99% of my clients come from a fact that they see me and they think I'm absolutely adorable and they just want to be in relationship with me. And they say, Hey, do you come, you know, and fix my life. That's not what happens. That's not it. That's not I how it goes. Oh, okay. calls. I get the <laughs> old crab calls. It's, you know, the EESC is on my front door. I've got this attorney, this letter from somebody's attorney. You know, I've got this employee who we need to, we fired and now, you know, they're threatening us. I get those types of calls all the time. It's probably the majority of the calls. And so what is important, even with a micropreneur, is that one, understand that just because you're not aware of the laws doesn't mean that you're not under them. Um, If you have one employee um, that is not an owner, if you have a physical work site, then you have to post all of the Department of Labor posters. Um, and there are, you can go into the Department of Labor website under, um, I think it's under forms and posters. You can print all of it out. You don't have to pay for it. Number two, you don't have to pay for any of those posters because they're free. Anything that the government makes you post is absolutely free. Oh yeah. There's services out there, aren't there? That like, we'll say, Hey, we'll send you these posters for this much money or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. If You're saying, tells yes, me, th- that's a good yeah. tip. If someone listens to just this and gets that like, Hey, you can just go print these posters for free. Like that's, you just got your money's worth right here on this. Uh, oh, on this absolutely. Interview, so. And you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that the government requires you to post, they have a free on their website. If you want something that's really pretty and shiny, you know, you can go to yeah. one of those vendors and I think they charge like thirty one ninety five for like a 10 and one. Let's say, for example, an Alabama poster, but you can get it for free. Um, the other thing is that if you have one employee that is not an owner, then you have to do an I-9 and E-Verify in the state of Alabama, for example. Mm. Um, all states aren't mandatory for E-Verify yet. Alabama is. But if you have one, you have to um, you have to absolutely do an I-9. Um, and the and define what that, that is. I, yeah, d- define the I-9. Isn't that like the... Um, it's an immigration form. I'm it's a resident, a, a yeah, form, immigration form. It's a form that um, says that the person that you're hiring is authorized to work into in the United States. Yeah. Um, they have to provide documents. They fill out section one. The employer fills out section two. Um, mo- probably one of the biggest things that I find when we do audits for companies is that their I-9s are, um, have errors. Um, ICE actually is the one that comes out to do the I-9 audits and they actually charge you for every single error on the I-9. So you can have one I-9 that can have about $300 worth of errors per form. But the biggest thing on the I-9 that I like people to always understand is that when you're doing the section two of the I-9, you have to look at the documents. So if somebody gives you a birth certificate or a passport, that's under um, list A, but a driver's license, social security card is the one that's the most common, which is list B and C. When you're filling out section two, the person is actually attesting under penalty of perjury that they have looked at that driver's license and that social security card and that it looks like it's authentic and that you have seen it. And then you're writing down that you're the authorized person that actually saw it. So if you're asking somebody to just send you a copy and you're just pencil whipping it, and in fact, they are not who they said they are, then the company is liable. Mm, Interesting. Now, why why do employees know some of these rules you're talking about and the employer does not necessarily? You said that earlier, and that kind of caught my attention. Why is that the case? (sighs) (laughs) You're going to get me in trouble. Okay. Yeah, is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know. Well, I know. That's I'm, that's I wanna, but I want to answer the question because okay. I've done a lot of um, I've done a lot of interviews regarding COVID, and I'm going to connect the two really quick. And and okay. I did a lot of interviews on COVID. Um, and one of the things that I always talked about is about, let's say, for example, unemployment. Okay, 
there were a bunch of employees that were going to their employer and there was work available. They were essential business. And they said to them, Hey, can you lay me off so I can get unemployment? Gotcha. So the employer felt sorry for them because they realized they were getting $875 a week, which was more than they were making. And they felt bad for them. And I was like, yeah, sure. But that was a violation of Alabama law because in order to be able to get unemployment, the, there had to be no work available and the person had to physically be available to get to do the work. And so it's the same thing. The employees knew that when they were asking to be put on layoff. And so you have very savvy employees that read every regulation. They were reading everything under FFCRA, everything under the CARES Act. They knew what they were entitled to before the companies did. But as I tell you know, my clients and other companies I speak to, your ignorance in the law and what you're supposed to do is not an excuse. The government does not care that you chose not to read the regulations. You are responsible for the law as a business owner. And so yeah. it's up to you to get the information. And so if you, you don't know where to go, that's fine. You contact, contact me. I, I usually give those initial consultations for free. There are plenty of people that you can call. Call another business and talk to the HR department and say, hey, I'm a new business owner. I know that y'all are big, but what forms am I supposed to have my employees fill out? HR people are very helpful by nature. We will answer the questions for you. Oh, that's cool. That's a good, that's a good tip right there for someone to kind of kind of sneak in there and find an HR person that's that'll be, that'll oh, yeah. be helpful and, and friendly. Just be sweet. Be nice. That that's uh being be nice. being nice is like half of a battle, you know. I've uh uh if you're just nice to people, you know, that can really that can really go a can really go a long way. Okay, so yeah, if you can sense. talk to someone and they enjoy talking to you. You typically give more information away because you're just having a conversation. And then you look up, you're like, I just gave away about a thousand dollars worth of information. I just gave away the farm here. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, I just, I hey, you know, hey. But I love them. They were, hey, they were nice. They were good. They were, they were, nice. They were nice. I enjoy the meal. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, so, what about uh, what about hiring folks or like hiring ad advice, especially for that, again, that micro business? Um, any, any thoughts there? So we talk about like some paperwork stuff. Um, but like, is there, is there a good way to do it? And I don't even necessarily mean the practical way. I mean, do you have any like strategies for hiring people? Because you know, you're on that, yeah. you see all this stuff. Like, do you go and do you work your network? Do you go and find people on these websites? Do you, what do you think? What do we do? You here? Don't do not under most circumstances, because there's some circumstances that are different. When you are hiring employees, go after the skill set that you need, not the person. There are so hmm. many organizations that have family members and best friends and frat brothers and my cousin's girlfriend and, you know, that work at the organization because they were easy. It's lazy hiring. Gotcha. Hire for the skill set. If you need someone that has a specific software experience or you need someone that has outside sales experience, then you don't go out to get somebody who you met at the bar who was really funny and he didn't talk to. I'm sure they can do sales. Why don't you go after somebody who actually has sales experience? Mm. It's the same thing for me. And I'm going to sound a little bit like an HR snob and I apologize in advance, but it's something that we have to combat all the time. When you as an organization are looking for your HR person, don't go look for the person with the bubbly personality that looks like a cheerleader. That's not who you need as your HR person. I just need somebody to keep the employees motivated. That's not the role of an HR person. The role of an HR person is to keep you out of, you know, court. Mm. You know, 90% of what we do is employment law. About 10% of it is psychology and helping people to kind of deal with situations and strategize. And so when you're looking for an HR person, it's more than, customer service. It's not people, customer service. It's not employee, customer service. It's law. What do you need to know? How do you strategize? So when you're hiring, I highly recommend that you write down a list, also known as a job description, um, that talks specifically about what it is that you want and what that person, the successful person will look like. And then after you do that, post. Just post it. You can post it on Indeed for free and mm -hmm. post for that job and start getting resumes. Now, if you see, you know, 
Bethany, who, you know, I've known for a really long time and she needs a job and, you know, she just recently got a divorce and she's got like a three-year-old son and she really needs a job. That's great. Have Bethany apply for the job, but Bethany better shake out just like those other candidates do and Mm -hmm. hire the best person for the job. The other thing I recommend is do not, do not keep the salary till the very end of the interview. When you start the Mm. interview, the first thing you should talk about is how much you're going to pay. Because if that person cannot work for that amount, you need to save your time and not get invested in them. And then all of a sudden at the end of the interview, when they say, I can't work for that, um, I've shared with you, I'm the perfect person for the job. I need $15,000 more. And now you're going to pay somebody something that you can't afford to pay. Start off with the pay. Um, And legally, you want to make sure that you ask every candidate the exact same questions so that no one can come back later and say that they were discriminated against because of a protected class, because you were conversational with your interviews instead of asking very poignant questions that are job related. They have to be job related. Mm, Interesting. I I, I didn't know that one, that an interview would have to be exactly the same kind of formatted. It needs to be. If you're growing, you, it needs to be. Um, I had, let me tell you a quick little story. Um, at a company that I work for that will remain completely nameless and a manager who I love that will also remain nameless. He went into an interview and during the interview, he was talking, he's super conversational, never liked to stick to the script, drove me crazy, loved him anyway. And he went into this conversation with this young lady about her having five children, how she was recently divorced and how, you know, her car broke down and all these other things. And he's sitting there listening. He's like, oh, that's really unfortunate. You know, well, I have four kids. And I mean, just entering into these conversations with her. Well, she didn't get hired. She didn't get hired because he never should have interviewed in the first place because she didn't meet the basic needs for the job. She left out of our offices, contacted the EEOC that same day and filed a charge of discrimination and filed a charge for gender discrimination. He did not hire her because she was a woman who had five children um, and that she was having a hard time getting um, back for She mentioned she was depressed. She said it was disability discrimination. And then when she did her charge, she mentioned all of the personal things that he said during the interview, which legitimized her claim because when the EEOC made us respond, we had to, it, it, to acknowledge, yeah, he does have four children. Yes, he said he did have a bout of depression because he could not keep his mouth shut during that interview. And it gave that, um, it gave that complaint um, complete validity. Wow. Okay. So this is um, $300,000 later, by the way. So this is terrifying to me. Um, but <laughs> so um, re- but before I ask a follow up on that, I don't want to forget this, the salary point that you made. That's a great point. Like, Hey, don't like let, everyone has time invested. Let's not waste time. What about, so putting it on a sal- should you put a salary range on the job description or would you advise against that? So I don't mind the range, but you need to put what is included within the range. So for example, if you tell me that the range for a position, let's say it's for mm-hmm. your assistant, Brooks, um, mm-hmm. and the range is 30000 to $40,000, okay? And then we go into the interview and I'm qualified and we go mm-hmm. into the interview and you say, what are your salary requirements? Guess what my number is? It's forty thousand. Forty thousand dollars. Yeah. Why would I Maybe say we'll thirty thousand when you're telling yeah. me you're going to pay forty? That doesn't make any sense. And so, if you're going to put a range, then you need to say why. So, you know, entry level here, or yeah. you know, experience. You need to have on the job description what the requireds are and what the wants are. And so, the wants are what's going to propel you. So, if you are, if you're asking for two years of experience. Yeah. in a certain software and the person has five years of experience, then they're the ones that are going to be able to get that higher range. It's somebody that can go into the position and immediately get to work rather than somebody you're going to have to train. Yep. Yeah. So that makes what sense. I prefer is you just yeah. give a number. Yeah. If you have so to list what... it, you just say 30, you just say 35, the pay is $35,000 a year. And then after you have a conversation with them and your top number was really 40. And then based on the number of years of experience, then you can give them more, but they've applied for the position because 35 is great. So anything you give them after that is just going to be gravy. 
but Got understand it. that under the Equal Pay Act and the Lily Led Better Fair Pay Act, that you need to be sure that whatever you're paying a man for a particular job and this mm -hmm. is what you're required to do and, and have, it's the same thing you've got to pay a woman. Mm -hmm. And so you can't have these discrepancies. And, you know, when I bring that up, people always look at me or like, well, you know, of course that's not an issue. You would be surprised how many companies take into consideration that a woman may be married and her husband is working or has a great mm. job when they're yeah. looking at the decision about salaries. Whereas if a male is the primary breadwinner in his family, they assume he needs more money. That is a discussion is I had three weeks ago with a very um, high profile company. So you can't take that for granted. Got it. Got it. That's yeah, that's really good information. That's a good point. Um, okay, so I, yeah, and, and you kind of followed up the point about the salary. I was going to change my question instead of range. I was going to say, you know, just should should we put the should I put a salary on a job description just in general? I generally what, what do you don't. Yeah, no. I generally okay. don't. But when um, we start the screening process, mm -hmm. um, when we start the screening process, it's the first question. And you, you can normally tell, you know, based on the type of companies that somebody has worked for, um, there's a movement right now to definitely take the um, salary question off of applications um, as a way mm -hmm. of making sure that the person is being compensated fairly for the job that they're doing. Um, and if someone was under a pay disparity because they weren't being paid e equally, then they may, if you look at their last salary, it may be relatively low. And if you're only giving them 2% on top of that, you're still keeping them below the threshold. Um, gotcha. So I typically, I don't ask on the application, but I generally start the conversation off. Hey, you know, this is, you know, Gia, very nice to talk to you today. I'm calling to talk to you about the position of an assistant for Brooks. Um, hey, just want to let you know the position pays fifteen dollars an hour. Is that something? Are you interested in moving forward? Gotcha, gotcha. Yes okay. or no? And if they say no, okay. that's not really what I was looking for, and that's my cap. Then let's get off the phone. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you. If I have a little wiggle room, okay. Well, what were you looking for? And then we'll yeah. know if we need to continue to stay on the phone or not. And that's huge because it saves everyone some time, right? Not just you. It saves them time. It saves everyone time. So that's a that's a great, you know, that, that's a great point. So, all right. So back earlier where you scared me and you terrified me, um, I, I, I totally, I, I get it. Like, you know, ignorant, and, and that's and that's not even in just, just in HR or this law. It's pretty much as a business owner, pretty much every law, every, anything that you have going on in your company, you're pretty much in charge of and responsible for. And uh, um, it, you can't, I guess if you're going to start a company, you kind of you can't let that terrify you. You just have to be as smart as you can and bring on the right you know partnerships and people that are smart like you. Um, otherwise, you'll never get started because if you really go in, right. this is my this is my opinion. If you go in deep and try to like read the IRS code or something crazy like that or whatever, okay. like you're gonna that. you're gonna fall asleep or you're gonna be terrified or you're gonna like I used to actually be concerned about like audits and stuff. I literally don't care now. I'm just like I don't have time to worry about it. Like I'm doing. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. I have a CPA, you know, good CPA friend. And like, yeah. um, Hey, it, I'm just gonna let, I'm just gonna let them handle it. You know, when something happens and, and therefore I, you know, I run, I run my ship, I got my ship. And so just, just as you know, for folks getting started, I just don't think you can get completely caught up. So even though no. some of this may scare people, it's like, don't let it, don't let it stop you from doing kind of, you know, what you need to do or whatever. But, um, don't underestimate the value of asking somebody to go to coffee. Yeah, good point. You know, I, when I started my business um, and I, I've got an MBA, I still, I know about finance. I'm pretty finance savvy, but about mm -hmm. accounting, my God. I mean, I have to go back and count 10 $1 bills over five times because I lose interest, like maybe about by dollar eight. I don't <laughs> care anymore. And I have to start over again. Everybody be completely quiet. And so when I started the business, the first thing I did was I found an accounting friend. I was like, hey, let's go to coffee. Will you tell me if I'm going to prison? And then I said <laughs> the same thing with an attorney friend. I was like, hey, I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. Am I going to prison? And so, I mean, I literally asked probably five different people to coffee, including somebody who was in my space mm -hmm. that was doing mm -hmm. things a little bit differently. And I said, hey, 
I just want to know, you know, how naive am I being right now? I'm moving forward. I got two projects, but I, I can't expect that that's going to hold me forever. Just poke holes in what I'm doing. Mm. Just poke holes in it. I'm not asking yeah. you to fix it. I'm asking you to tell me where I'm, I have blind spots. And so mm -hmm. if you ask someone, hey, can we have coffee? And I want to see if the IRS is going to come knocking at my door and drag me and my kids out of the house. They're mm -hmm. going to they're going to say, yes, they're not going to charge you for that time. Buy yeah. their coffee. Ask them if they'd like a scum. I think the bigger issue is not specifically in do you have to be an expert in all things? And am I willing to hire a professional to fix everything? I think you have to open your mouth and say when you need help. And if you don't know something, say, hey, I don't know this. Does anybody have any advice or any resources that I can use? Because there's going to be another business owner, another micropreneur who went through the same thing a couple of years ago. They were like, yeah, I got a guy. I got this lady that you should call. Or here's an article. Or here's something that I've read. Or have you been on the Department of Labor website? There are resources. My issue is if you know you don't know anything, mm -hmm. you keep your mouth um, covered and you keep your mouth closed and you continue to do damage and you don't care. That is my mm. issue. As yeah. not only as a, as, a, as a fellow taxpayer, as a fellow entrepreneur, you know, as a, bus as a citizen, you know, in the business community and as the person that has to fix the mess ups, for businesses who trusted someone and found out that they weren't, you know, doing things the way that they should be doing them. So yeah. you have a vested interest as a community partner um, to at least find out what you don't know. Yep. Yep. No, that's good. At, w at what point should someone, at what point does a micro business or someone, you know, with that's getting going and they're growing, maybe they're hiring their first, Maybe they're hiring their first employee. I mean, do they need do they need a company like yours? Do they need someone like you yet? Or at what point is you know would you say you're necessary, or or how does that work? So a great question. So um, I'm going to tell you something that um, other HR firms are probably going to start sending me black roses in the mail. Um, I do not believe that a company needs an employee handbook until they have over 25 employees. Okay. Okay. Um, there are lots of companies that will try to sell you an employee handbook at five, if five employees. Um, if you're on a growth plan, um, I think that you need to be a little bit more stable before you um, have a handbook because that thing is going to be the Bible to your folks. Gotcha. So if you're constantly changing your processes um, and things are growing, then, I mean, it, it really could have some serious implications. Um, next is that you're not under the EEOC jurisdiction until you have 50 employees. And so that doesn't mean that you can't get in trouble for harassment, discrimination and things of that nature. It means that mm -hmm. a chunk of your handbook really is about, um, those types of items. 50 at 50 employees. Let's go back. 47, because you're probably going to hire a couple more soon. At 47 employees, you absolutely need to reach out to somebody and make sure you have processes in place. Gotcha. So 20, you need to have something in place. You need to make sure you're doing things the way that they're supposed to be done. When you've got about five employees, it's a quick conversation. Hey, here's the situation. Um, a lot of my micro um, entrepreneurs um, that are clients, they give me a call when there's a problem. If you have a problem, you get a letter in the mail, an employee tells you that they've been harassed or, you know, they said that they're being mistreated. Any of those things are going on a leave yeah. of absence. They think they have FMLA. At that point, that's when you need to reach out to somebody like me if you're really small. But Got you it. can call me. Look, if, if it's really good coffee, we can have coffee and I'll tell you <laughs> to do this, this and this and that. But um, also at 50 employees, you're looking um, at crossing a threshold for having to offer um, medical benefits to your employees. Gotcha. Okay. Completely different. I mean, that's a completely different thing. So about 47, you need to start reaching out to somebody like me and say, Hey, I need a full overhaul. We need to make sure we're doing everything properly because you're about to go in a completely 
different world where your fines are going from a couple of thousand dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars at that 50 got gotcha. you got gotcha. you got gotcha. you okay so so to recap so if a, uh, if a company has just say less than 10 employees i think it, there's a technical definition for a micro business apparently it is like less than 10 employees or mm -hmm. something like that so mm -hmm. i mean let's say let's say that's the number we're going with in reality really don't i don't really need your these full-on services but maybe if there's an issue i can like use a company like yours for kind of that consultation for specific issues with those employees is that is that is that correct if you don't if you've gone let's say for example you've gone into the department of labor you've gone to the department of mm -hmm. revenue because they've got really great resources for very small businesses um okay. you have it first of all a couple of things you need you need an accountant you need an mm -hmm. attorney um, and you need somebody that is knowledgeable about HR that you can call. Okay. Gotcha. So if you have an issue, call the HR person. If you're doing things, you're setting up interview guides, you've had some weird situations, you're not sure what forms that need to be filled out. It's a quick call. Hey, what do I, what do I need to have? That may cost you $250. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you've got 25 employees or more, you're starting to have some employee issues. I think at that time, you definitely need to reach out to somebody, either your attorney or an HR professional to say, hey, what do I need to put in place? Because at that point, you need something for time off requests, um, how you're going to handle attendance, um, how your managers are supposed to deal with the employees, chain of command um, for reporting, things of that nature, incident, injury reporting, things of that nature. When you're at about 47, you're about to go into 50, you better have somebody do an HR for you at that point. And again, gotcha. not just your wife because she has some spare time or your husband because, you know, he used to be a really good manager of people, but somebody that has a firm understanding of HR law, either an HR consultant or your employment attorney. I use a couple of attorney of firms around here. Johnson and Adams is my absolute favorite. Call somebody and get some assistance because what you do not know can put you out of business. Wow. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, okay. That's good. That's a great, that's a great roadmap. I think for folks, for folks listening that are kind of, they can kind of gauge where they are in business and where they're headed and, and kind of use that information for what they but ask um, questions. What makes sense sure. for them? Ask questions. Yeah. Coffee. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think you like coffee. You must I like, do like coffee. coffee. You like I coffee? haven't had a lot yeah. today. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I need some. Yeah. <laughs> I'd hand you one virtual. We can't do the coffee, right? I'd, I know. I'd be having soon. A coffee with you right now. Very yeah. soon. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, all right. Is there is there a question? I'm, I'm gonna kind of wrap this up. I'm a, I, I know I know we're kind of needing to needing to wrap it up. Is there a question that uh, folks don't ask you, and you're like, I wish they would ask me this because I really have good info on this. Is there is there just something that that hits you. If it doesn't, that's okay. But if there is that's something, that's a great question. Time that's time. a twenty-minute question right there, though. <laughs> um, I think that the question, the question that people typically don't ask me about that I wish they would, is about what is true harassment and discrimination look like. Okay. I think that's the question they don't ask. Um, I think that most people are afraid of the answer. Um, I do a training on harassment and discrimination, and it talks about the difference between flirting and harassment. Um, and, you know, one of the funny things about harassment in, in, in particular is that um, it's not right up until the moment that it is. Mm, so at 8 o'clock, I, I like when you rub my shoulders, and 801, I no longer like. Oh, I got you back. We're good. <laughs> All right, let's let's let. While well, I have that on my on my mind, let's just go right back to it because you 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 were saying at eight o'clock, you're rubbing shoulders or something, and eight oh one, something's happening or, or whatever. If at eight oh one, if I no longer want to be touched, okay, we we've had this relationship. Every day you see me, you come and you roll my rub my shoulders. You tell me how pretty I am, how much you love my shoes. And it's perfectly fine. And at eight o'clock, I, I think it's great. And at eight oh one, I decide that it's unwanted. Mm -hmm. You're entering the realm of sexual harassment at that point, because the person could prove 
that it has been severe and pervasive. It they can if they can prove that it has impacted their job performance. If that person has a witness to say, yeah, you know what? Every now and again, um, she mentions that you know he keeps rubbing her shoulders, and so she just goes the other way. You you are now congratulations in the, the avenue of sexual harassment. It freaks me out whenever somebody all of a sudden you know marries like their assistant, and I'm like, no. So <laughs> because it, it, it's that close, you know, the, the, the um, line between we're dating um, and I'm the person's boss and the person is not working out. And then the person coming back to say we were only dating because I was afraid I was going to lose my job. Wow. It's one okay. argument away. You're one argument away from being in that situation. And so yeah. the question that I wish that people would ask me is, how to avoid those types of situations. And the other one is um, I would like for more business owners to ask me how to resolve issues if they're the one that's the problem. Interesting. They're probably not going to ask you that one a lot because they Sometimes. may not <laughs> sound, you know, humility is a tough thing a lot of times, you know? And so do that do you think those folks realize they're the problem and they just don't want to ask how to solve it or do you think they don't even realize it what do you think they think that um i think it's a little bit of a god complex and i don't have to deal with it it's my company you know gotcha. so you know if you don't want if you don't like it you don't have to work here anymore i do a training on abusive leadership that talks about that in particular um, what to do when the person that is the abusive person on the team is the person that's writing the checks you know, what you do in that situation. Um, yeah. And I think that sometimes, I think that's the beauty of having a consultant come in. And I think that's the beauty of kind of what I do um, because of the relationship that I have. I have no problem calling out a business owner and telling them that he's being a jerk or that mm. she's being a jerk and saying, mm -hmm. you know, you're, why are you speaking to them that way? Would you speak to me that way? Why are you cursing? Uh, why are you using profanity? Um, why are you intimidating them on purpose? Um, what is the point? And if everybody walked out, would you be able to do everybody's job? And I think that it's, I, today, actually, right before we got on a call, there was someone who asked me, called me confidentially and asked me if I would call the business owner and tell the business owner that they were doing a thing. Oh, wow. They were next door to them. And, but they were afraid to go over there because they're like, gee, it'll come. Um, in, in those types of situations, I think having a consultant on hand to be able to tell the truth and to be able to speak in love and call things out, I think it's really important. But it's very important for entrepreneurs to be very self-aware if they're the ones that are in fact making it uh, uh, an unbearable workplace. You've got to take that into consideration. Um, my husband always tells me you got to look at the common denominator. If everybody is acting nuts around you, you've got to figure out what the common denominator is. And if that common denominator is you, then you need That's to good. yourself. That's good. That's a good point. Um, yeah, sometimes tough to do that, but if you can, uh, if you can take some self-actualization, you know, and take some ownership of that issue, then that's good. Um, and hire people around you that are always going to tell you the truth. Because people ah, say that's... you're being a jerk. And I say, thank you for telling me I'm being a jerk right now. It can hurt. It can hurt, but it's good. Yeah, I agree with you. It's very important to know to know the truth, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. All right. So how, how can people connect with you? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go. But how, how can folks look you up, your company, connect with you? What's the best way for people to do that? Um, many different ways. And so my email address is Gia Wiggins at morale Check out our website, morale um, .com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn under Gia Wiggins. Um, I am very active in the community. I'm usually at a chamber or I'm at, you know, some event, um, all times. Um, I'm also on Facebook under morale resource and Instagram as well. So, um, if you look for my name or you look for morale resource, we're synonymous. And I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. And I really like coffee. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Well, Dr. Gia Wiggins, it's been awesome catching up with you today. We made it through the storm. I appreciate 
I appreciate you taking your time and I hope that you have a great rest of your week and we will, uh, we will talk more soon. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed it and everybody have a great day. All right. Take care. All right, guys, that was Dr. Gia Wiggins. Hope you guys got some great value from that. And if you um, have questions about what to do in hiring and people and what you need to do, obviously you found out that she likes coffee. So I think if you take her out to a coffee or look her up and maybe get her a virtual coffee, if you're not in the area, she'll love it. So if you want to get connected with what we're doing, we have events coming up. We have some exciting things coming out. We have something called Fail Forward coming up, which is an in-person event. We have an, a virtual event that we're actually announcing fairly soon. Make sure you're connected with us. Just go to our website, gulfcoastbizcon.com, and you can connect with us there. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you guys on the next show. Take care.